Good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca. I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. While we're waiting for some more to join here, please enjoy this short video about text to drive automation. I hope everyone enjoyed that video. I do have just a couple housekeeping notes before we get started. You'll notice that you are muted. That's just to keep any of the background noise out so everybody can hear. You do have the option available uh, to type a question from your chat panel at any time throughout the presentation. I do encourage you to take advantage of that. Simply click on the icon with a question mark and those, answers, uh, those questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. So today's webinar, we bring in Jamie Dickerson. She is the Chief Payments Officer for text to drive Jamie holds her certified payments professional credentials. She has over 15 years of experience in the payments industry and is a member of various organizations, including the Electronic Transaction Association and Women in Payments Leadership. Prior to joining text to drive Jamie worked for the largest processor in the United States. During her tenure there, she collaborated with various departments, including compliance, fraud, security, and risk. This allowed her to gain a deeper understanding of the challenges merchants face with combating fraud effectively and the tools available. Her focus has been and will always be educating merchants to help them ensure they are doing the necessary things to protect their business. Jamie is a resource in both her company as well as industry. She is frequently requested by consulting companies to provide her input on best practices to prevent fraud. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker, Jamie Dickerson, for the Fraud Prevention Webinar. Jamie, can you hear me? You're uh, you're not on. Sorry, <laughs> I will start over. I apologize for that. 
Um, good morning to all. Thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Um, good morning to you all or afternoon, depending upon where you reside within the United States. Um, before we get, or before we jump into the presentation, I would like to take a moment and share with you why I joined text to drive I was actually introduced to the text to drive team about three years ago uh, by a mutual client that thought it would be beneficial for us to collaborate. Early on, it was apparent while working with the team that they had similar ideas and thoughts about payments and the technology. There were two things that stood out to me as I worked with the text to drive team. First was their passion for their customers and the industry that they serve. And next was that they were very adamant about creating the best automation platform in the industry. In 2019, the CEO, Greg Owen, asked if I would be interested in joining his team. This is in large part due to his understanding of the complexities that come with payment processing and acceptance. And he wanted an expert on his team that could bring insight and value to his customers. In May of 2019, I provided my two weeks notice to the processor that I had worked for for over 14 and a half years, and I made the leap over to text to drive and join their team. I want to share with you, or take a moment and share with you, our mission statement for our speed checkout payment solution. And that is to provide dealerships with the best payment solution and create efficiencies, provides convenience, and is the most cost-effective and secure payment application in the auto industry. We believe our mission has been accomplished. Through our web series, webinar series, our goal is to bring our clients and partners beneficial information. Today, we are going to dive into the topic of fraud prevention. It is our hope that through this webinar, you will gain a deeper understanding of the fraud landscape along with the tools and practices that you can implement to protect your company. So with that said, I am going to open it up with our first polling question before we actually dive into the presentation. And I'll give you a moment to um, give your input on this question and then we'll go ahead and close out that poll and share the results. I'll give you about 20 more seconds and then we'll go ahead and close the poll. Okay, I'm getting ready to close the poll. Okay, we'll go ahead and share these results. So 68% stated credit cards. Well, you know what? The majority wins. That's actually the, the preferred payment method. So when we look at the preferred payment methods and trends, credit cards are actually number one. Um, this is in large part due to the rewards, convenience, security, ease of the transaction, and the reporting that come along with credit cards. That is closely followed by, behind by cash. Um, unfortunately, cash is no longer king. However, it's pretty close still. And then you have your traditional payment methods such as debit cards and checks. And then those, uh, you know, those higher security level of payments such as PayPal and Apple Pay, and then your peer-to-peer -peer payment solution. So when we take a look at the payment trends that are taking place, we have to take a look at the various generations and how they're actually impacting these payments. As generations continue to evolve, they are influencing these payments, and the consensus is amongst all generations is that they like ease and convenience, they like to use credit cards or debit cards, and they like mobile payments and electronic receipts. So let's take a look at the ongoing challenges of credit card fraud, and I'm going to open up another polling question here and test your knowledge. So I will launch this and give you a few minutes to answer, and then we'll close that poll and share the results. Give it a couple. 
couple more seconds here, and then we'll go ahead and close the polls out. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share the results. So, do EMV cars or does the EMV chip technology um, liability ship provide full protection against fraud? The answer is no. So, once again, the majority of you answered this one correctly. So let's take a look about look at EMV in this technology. Um, of course, EMV chip technology has been around for over 10 years. It was actually created to provide additional protection from fraud to the card holders. And essentially what EMV stands for is EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa, as they were the founding fathers of this technology, and it has since evolved um, to the following card brands that you see on the screen today. It was first implemented in the UK, and the US was actually the last country to adopt this technology. The liability shift took place here in the United States in October 1st of 2015. And with this, um, you know, implementation of these EMV cards, the liability shift was really promoted by the card brands to um, provide a liability shift and an incentive for merchants to adopt this technology. And essentially what would happen is if you, were, if you had a business and you put this technology into place um, to accept the chip cards and that business accepted a fraudulent transaction, um, the issuer of the card would take on the liability for that transaction and the merchant would re or maintain the sale for that transaction. First, this only applied to card present transactions. In addition to that, businesses were really slow to implement this type of uh, technology. And this was um, due to two different factors. First was the cost of the hardware upgrades that came along with EMV. Um, and then there was also a lot of uncertainty as to what type of security these cards would actually um, provide. And things are, you know, it didn't really help when the FBI released their public service amount announcement shortly after the liability shift. Um, and within this uh, public service announcement on EMV chip cards, they, um, they stated in here that while the EMV chip cards offer enhanced security, the FBI is warning law enforcement, merchants, and the general public that no one technology eliminates fraud and cyber criminals will look for opportunities to steal payment information. Now, I don't know about you, but if that's not a compelling statement within itself um, to create uncertainty, I don't know what is. With that said, they went on to talk about the technical details of the chip cards and they, um, you know, stated that there's two types of cards that are being released. There's the chip and signature, and then there's also the chip and pin. And they go on to state that the chip and pin is only known by the card holder and the issuing financial institution, and that not all POS terminals can accept the pin associated with these cards. So to date, only 44% of all U.S. businesses have actually adopted this technology to accept these chip cards. So let's talk a little bit about what do the card brands say about EMV and the liability shift? Well, interestingly enough, each brand has their own rules and regulations when it comes to the liability shift. The consensus amongst all brands is that these are a more secure type of card, and this is large in part due to the twofold authentication. In addition to that, they state that the liability shift is determined by which party has the highest level of security. Now, to better explain that, essentially what that means is, is if a card is issued with a chip and pin and a merchant only has the ability to accept a chip and signature card, the higher level of security would fall on the issuer, therefore the liability would fall on the merchant. So as you can tell, there's some complexities here that we're starting to see. In addition to that, um, there are certain cards that are exempt from the liability shift. So Visa commercial cards and PIN debit cards are exempt from the liability shift. 
And in addition to all of this information, there are additional rules and regulations for stolen cards and who holds the liability, making it even more complex. So let's talk about the three types of prevalent credit card fraud. So when we take a look at credit card fraud, I think the one that is um, gaining most momentum is account takeover. And this is very complex in the fact that, first of all, it's not a single event. And what this entails is this one, this is when the cyber criminal not only starts, steals the cardholder information, but they also acquire the personal identifiable information for that cardholder. And so what they're able to do is they're able to call in and change account password, billing address, uh, they can change their, their phone numbers associated, email addresses, all of that pertinent information, they can go in and take over and change that. And, and then what they do is they wait until all of that information has been updated, and then they go and commit their fraud. And the challenge is, is that they don't limit their transactions because they realize at this point, if the issuer reaches out to them to verify a transaction, it is not going to actually go to the cardholder. It's going to come to that fraudster because they changed all the information on that account. And unfortunately, because this is such a tricky type of fraud, ultimately at the end of the day, the merchant ends up holding that liability for that transaction. Next is clean fraud. Clean fraud um, is this takes place, um, first of all, the information typically is stolen from these big box retailers. And these hackers, essentially what they do is they lay dormant, they somehow get into their network or get onto their device and they lay dormant and wait for the opportune time to gain as much data as they possibly can so they can go and sell that on the deep dark web and then somebody else purchases all that data and then they use it for fraudulent transactions. With this type of fraud, essentially all they're gaining is just the primary account number or the actual credit card number, along with sometimes the CVV, which is the cardholder uh, verification value, as well as the address verification, so the billing address and the billing zip code. And typically when this information is stole, stolen, it's stolen in the region where the zip code matches up because when those fraudsters that are purchasing the data, they actually want to buy information in their region so it doesn't look like it's out of sorts when the transaction's going through. So this is uh, clean fraud. And once again, the merchant ends up holding the liability for this type of fraud. And then last but not least is friendly fraud. Friendly fraud doesn't happen or the information is not stolen through, you know, these these cyber criminals. This is, uh, this is the actual cardholder who is disputing a transaction. And it can be innocent or it can be malicious. And there's various types of friendly fraud that can take place. First, you have the family and friends. So when you think about cardholder accounts, there are authorized account holders that can actually process transactions on that account and they are authorized to do so. But many a times, you know, children will go and take their parents' credit card and go use it without letting them know that they took it to make that transaction. And that's where it can get a little bit tricky because what happens is when that takes place, that child is going to use that trans or use that card to pay for their service or pay for a part that they purchased, and they don't tell their parent, and then their parent receives their statement and doesn't recognize the transaction. And so they automatically go to their issuing card bank and they dispute that transaction. Next is buyer's remorse. This is when a, uh, a consumer files a dispute because they're not happy with the service that they received or they feel after they made the transaction that they were taken. And instead of going back to the business to deal with them and try to um, fix the situation, they just go directly to their issuing card bank and dispute that transaction. Next is an expired refund. Of course, many businesses have invoices and on the bottom of those invoices, they have disclosures such as timeframes when you can receive a refund. Um, 
And in this case, the customer falls outside of that disclosure time frame for a refund. And so instead of coming back to the dealership, they decide that they're going to go to their issuing card bank to dispute that transaction. And then last but not least are the true shoplifters. These are the individuals who understand the rules and regulations of the card brands. They know what they can get away with, and so what they'll do is they will dispute a transaction, get their money back for that transaction, and of course, the dealership holds the liability. And then, in a lot of cases, they'll go and make another transaction within a certain time frame because they know that you haven't received that dispute, list, dispute yet, and therefore, you haven't alerted your employees to no longer accept you know, a transaction from that individual, and therefore they go and they make another fraudulent transaction before you catch up with it. So unfortunately, they're, the facilitators of friendly fraud um, don't make it easy, or they don't make it easy for the merchants, they make it easy for their cardholders. So in today's world, of course, we have online banking, we have all of these different apps and resources to do a dispute, and so having to actually physically go into a bank anymore and actually file a dispute is no longer um, required. Uh, individuals can go online and they can go through an app to dispute that transaction. In addition to that, uh, there's reduced issuer scrutiny. And this is in large part because banks are trying to lower their customer service expenses and they want to retain their customers. So they don't investigate or really try to dig deep into is this truly a fraudulent transaction or does this transaction really, was it really legit? So these are the unfortunate pieces of friendly fraud. So let's take a look at some of the complex fraudulent cases that are out there um, to, that have actually been um, released this year. So, actually, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so let's talk about fraud. Um, I'm going to actually take a step back here, and we're going to do another polling question. So I'm going to release this poll. I'm going to go ahead and launch it, and I'll let you go ahead and answer this question. So this is what type of data is breached most? a couple more seconds here to answer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and let's share the results. So, this is interesting, a tie between personal details and online records followed by financial and or info, as well as health records. Well, for those of you that answered personal details, that is actually the correct answer. So I'm gonna get back to our presentation here. So let's take a look about, at data breaches. First, I think it's pertinent to understand that when a data breach is released, typically the ones that you see are only the public companies because they're required to publish their data breaches. And unfortunately, with that said, the smaller or private companies are not required to do that. But unfortunately, there are so many breaches hap happening in the private sector that it's really um, becoming challenging um, more and more. So with that said, let's take a look at the actual data breaches that were published in 2018. As you can see, there were 4.4 billion data records that were compromised. And of those data records, 49% of that actually stemmed from the United States. And unfortunately, with that, the largest incidents included personal details. So ultimately, the lesson learned from these data breaches that are continuing to take place is that cyber criminals are becoming more sophisticated in their schemes. So now let's take a look at the, the current fraud state and the cases that are out there this year. So the first one reads, um, the headline reads, Bayrab Malware Gang convicted of infecting over 400,000 computers worldwide, stealing millions through auto or online auctions. 
this uh, criminal ring actually started their schemes in 2007. And they actually started with um, uh, fraudulent auctions. They went online and they auctioned off fake cars via social media and Craigslist and would have their victims wire them the money. And with that, the victims had no recourse when they found out that they weren't receiving their vehicle. So this was their first tactic when they started their fraud um, ring. And unfortunately, uh, because of you know all the losses that were taking place, more and more people were becoming more aware of their schemes. And so they realized that they had to find other means to uh, commit fraud. So they expanded to hacking and planting malware. Um, they would steal credit card information, personal identifiable information. They did money laundering. Um, their their uh, schemes were unlimited. And it is actually said that they profited an estimated $30 million plus through their various criminal attacks. So in 2017, one of the um, ringleaders uh, was selling some information on the deep dark web and he forgot to um, access his virtual private network and he was, um, they, they, his identity was exposed. And so they ended up catching up with them and this, in uh, July, I believe it was, of this year, they were actually convicted um, for their fraud. The next headline reads, fraudsters use fake ID to buy new F-150. This fraudster in Canada used a fake ID and a, fake, or a, a stolen credit card information to purchase an F-150 in October. Um, what happened was once he uh, got away with the financing and got away with the vehicle, the stolen vehicle, uh, the actual person whose identity was stolen and used for this financing um, saw it on their credit report and alerted the police, and the police investigated. And interestingly, this fraudster was at the Canadian border going through customs trying to smuggle this F-150 overseas, and he was caught there. Next. The next headline reads, Glowing Reviews Tout Counterfeit Cash on the Dark Web. This was a counterfeiting operation known as Billmaker, and they passed $4.1 billion in $100 bills, primarily on the West Coast. And then the last one is uh, part of the uh, FDIC Consumer News, and they talk about being be aware of fake checks and fake check scams, and they were alerting both consumers and businesses. So what's the lessons learned from all of this? Fraud has no limits, and it does not discriminate. Wherever these fraudsters can find an opportunity to money launder, they are doing just that. So let's take a look, about, look at the fraud prevention tools that are out there. So for credit card processing, you have your basic, fraud filter. So these are items such as the CVV and the address verification to validate that that cardholder is who they are. And what it does is it matches up with what's um, on the issuing card bank side. The challenge with this is that 90% of the fraudulent transactions that go through this day and age actually contain the matching AVS and CVV. And that's in large part due to that clean fraud that's taking place and that additional information that they're able to, um, to uh, steal when they're um, taking that information or such. Next, you have 3D Secure 2.0. Uh, 3D Secure 2.0, it actually um, is for card not present transaction and it counts the liability shift similar to EMB. But I think first, to understand 3D Secure, you really need to understand the original version of 3D Secure, which was 1.0. Essentially what this was, is it was a form of card not present verification or secondary authentication that was um, through the various card brands. So you had Verify by Visa, MasterCard Secure Code, and American Express Safe Key. And essentially what would happen is you would go online, purchase an item, 
And then if you had the, if they had the solution on their website and you had verified by Visa, let's say, you would receive an email. And before you could pr proceed with that transaction, you would have to go over to your email and get the code that Visa sent to you for that transaction. And then you would have to input it into that verified by Visa code um, box. And then you could proceed with your transaction. The challenge with this was that um, many consumers were frustrated, you know, because they didn't want to wait for that, that verification code to come through their email or via text. And so they would actually abandon their shopping cart. And so what was happening was more and more merchants were losing sales, even for absolutely good transactions. So that was actually the original version of 3D Secure. Well, 3D Secure 2.0 actually was a partnership um, with EMV as well. And so it was um, driven more towards the card not present transactions. And originally it was meant to suffice the new UK PSD2 um, that was going into place. And what that stands for is Payment Services Directive 2. Now, if you recall, when we were talking about EMV, the UK was actually the first country to adopt EMV card present transactions. And they were the first one to see more and more trans or fraud transitioning over to the card not present space. So they have um, created new laws and rules that uh, their government has put into place to try and stop that fraud from happening. And so with that, that's where 3D Secure 2.0 came into place. Now with that said, um, because you know all of the rules and regulations that come about are based upon countries, the country that you're in or the country that that card is issued in. And so the challenges in the United States is that not all banks are on board at this time with the different authentication, um, secondary authentication tools such as verified by Visa, MasterCard, Secure Code, and American Express Safe Key. In addition to that, it also still poses a possible friction in that there is that code that can still be sent. While they say it's going to be less apt for that to happen, the reality is that it still can happen and that can create um, shopping cart abandonment. In addition to that, merchant must first adopt 3, 3D Secure 1.0 to create rules or risk rules. And essentially, that's very difficult because if you don't understand the um, fraud landscape and what you know type of rules you really need to put into place, that can become very difficult. Next, they have limited data points. As you see, they have 150 data points that are examined. And the card types covered, while there's no rules actually released in the United States, from what we are seeing, currently this only covers Visa and MasterCard. And um, there's some similarities to card present EMV, you know, rules regarding liability shift for highest level of security. So as you can see, this is a very complex solution. While it's a better solution and it does provide, you know, some fraud prevention, there's still some complexity to it. Next is advanced fraud prevention. Advanced fraud prevention, it leverages um, these various different types of uh, technology. So first you have your rules base, so you have your CVV, your ABS, and then additional rules that you can put into place based upon your knowledge of fraud. And then in addition to that, it also takes into account artificial intelligence. So it looks at the behaviors of that person or of that cardholder versus the actual transactions that, that's being processed. What's in the norm? What's outside of the norm? It's looking at all of these various pieces to take a look at what are those habits for that, that cardholder. And then last but not least is machine learning. This is where we can actually go in and take a look at, you know, the device fingerprinting or the, the biometrics of that device. We can look at the geolocation. There's so many different factors that we can see. We can see when did this um, person set up this phone, you know, um, does it match up with the cardholder information? So this is a much, much robust, much more robust type of fraud prevention solution that is in place or that is out there this day and age. And it examines over 400 data points when it's looking at fraud for any given uh, fraudulent or potential fraudulent transaction. 
So next, because we did talk about some of those headlines that were taking place, I do want to mention um, ID scanners. Um, this is a great way to, you know, combat those um, ID fraud that's taking place. And I know there are some uh, financial services out there, such as Mercedes Financial Services, that actually require dealerships to have this in place to validate the identity of that ID. So um, this is just a, a tool that can be used to help protect your dealership. Next is a smart safe. Um, smart safes can actually uh, check bills for to see if they're counterfeit, similar to when you go to your uh, financial institution and you go to make a deposit, they're checking for counterfeits. That's the exact same thing that this does. There's some additional benefits as well to a safe. It can help with self-cashiering, um, allow you to not have to worry about sending an employee to the bank to make a deposit and you know incur that risk of somebody robbing them because couriers come by and pick up the funds. And the great thing about Safe Cash as well, or Smart Smart Safe rather, they actually have the ability to automatically deposit those funds in real time into your DDA. Next is the check reader to combat check fraud. This actually encrypts. Um, it, it has an encrypting microscanner that encrypts the check data instantly. But in addition to that, it also has a, a magna print um, in the microdata to actually check for fraudulent checks. And this helps with increased productivity, remote deposits, and such as well, eliminating you from having to also make fake runs. So what is uh, text to drive doing um, to combat fraud and how are we doing that? Um, we have actually uh, created our own fraud prevention solution called Fraud Protect. And it is actually text to drives premier fraud prevention solution. And essentially what it does is going back to that advanced fraud prevention solution, that is exactly what we're doing. As the FBI had warned, no one technology combats fraud. So we realize we have to use various technologies to get a broader picture to ensure that we're not passing fraud through. So what we do is we look at that artificial intelligence, the machine learning, and those rules along with that. Our fraud partner is, our fraud prevention partner is actually Count. Count is one of the uh, front leaders of the fraud prevention industry. Actually, they were one of the first companies to provide a fraud prevention solution, and they're actually voted one of the top 10 financial fraud detection solutions of 2018. Actually, they're the only one in their class, so it really makes them stand out. And essentially what they're able to do is they are able to take a look at all of the transactions that are passed through, and they're, look, they're leveraging all of that big data that I had previously mentioned, and they provide us with an approval or a decline. And this all takes place within milliseconds. So it's very, very fast, and we're able to leverage, you know, good data that gives us a solid foundation as to whether a transaction is fraudulent or not. So how do they go about doing that? So once again, we were talking about the artificial intelligence and you know the behaviors that go along with that. That's also called unsupervised machine learning. And that actually is able to look at emerging fraud attacks that are taking place. And they actually, I want to take your, um, uh, your you over to the side here where it says universal data network. Um, because I want to, really want to focus in on this, because this is really the big piece of their solution. They are able to leverage all the data from throughout their all their customer base of 6,500, and this includes financial institutions, some of the largest financial institutions in the world, as well as um, payment processors, and then also some larger uh, retailers. So they take in all that information and they're able to leverage that and, and see habits and behaviors and see when they're starting to see fraud going on. And so that all fits into that supervised machine learning where they, 
they look at all of that data and they base their decision upon that. So it's a very, very robust solution that really takes a deep, deep dive um, to ensure that we're preventing fraud. So with that said, uh, Fraud Protect Fraud Prevention um, Partner Counts, these are some of their partners that feed that database. As you can see, these are some pretty well-known businesses and financial institutions throughout the United States. And in addition to that, and the world rather, and with that, as you can see, they've won many different awards for their solution um, over the years and most recently. So as you can see in uh, 2018, they were the Card Not Present Award Best Anti-Fraud Solution. Um, so we really thought long and hard about what solution would best protect our clients' transactions. And that's exactly what Count and Fraud Protect are able to do for you. So with that said, um, I think there's a couple of key takeaways that we need to think about um, within this presentation. First, we know that fraudsters are diversifying their attacks. And in order to have a fighting chance, dealerships must have a multi-pronged approach and solution in place. And you must not forget the human factor. You know, while there are foolproof full anti-fraud solutions out there, just like ours with Fraud Protect, the reality is there's still going to be some bearing on the employees that you have to ensure that they're preventing fraud as well. So with that said, I think this is a very poignant quote um, that I want to end with. War is not about eliminating risk. It's about managing them. And with fraud, that is that could not be more true. Um, so with that said, I will turn it back over to Rebecca so we can open it up for questions. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we do not have any questions currently at this time. So if you are wanting to ask something to Jamie, uh, you have that ability. Just go over to your chat panel, click on that question mark. I'll leave it open here for another minute or two and see if we get any of those questions coming through. All right, Jamie, first question here for you. What do I need to do if I want to implement this at my store? With our Fraud Protect solution, um, that is actually, uh, we're able to implement that through our speed checkout solution. So you can actually reach out to us and I'd be happy to speak with you about that. Um, it actually is included with our uh, speed checkout uh, direct solution, so I'd be happy to speak with you about that and show you how we could really benefit your uh, dealership. Perfect. Next question here, what protects dealerships, if anything, from customers paying online and having another individual pick up their vehicle in service? Well, um, so, I, I want to make sure I understand that right. So let's address the first question. So what protects dealerships online um, from fraud taking place? Well, with this type of solution um, or through our uh, speed checkout solution, we have online bill pay. That's a really great tool to utilize um, for fraud prevention when you're allowing somebody to pay remotely um, because we're able to leverage, you know, all of that data that's coming from both their device as well as their email address. So that really um, buckles up or, or buttons up the data um, to ensure that that transaction is legit. 
Now, with that said, um, you know, if, when somebody's picking up that, that vehicle, um, the best practice should always be to, you know, ensure that, that that service advisor knows that customer, or if they don't, that they are getting, you know, a copy of their ID to make sure that, you know, that's an authorized person picking up that vehicle. So that would be a practice and a protocol that would be separate from the online transactions, but through our speed checkout solution, that really is the best way to prevent fraud when somebody's picking up their vehicle and wanting to pay remotely. Thank you. Next question here, what is the process currently if text to drive receives a fraudulent payment from a stolen credit card? What's the result of the dealership? So um, unfortunately with fraud, um, you know, I know there's a lot of, of uh, companies out there that really um, promote a guarantee, but because of the complexity of fraud that's taking place this day and age, there is no guarantee. But I will state um, with our solution, it really is the most proactive solution to combat fraud because it is looking to ensure that the person who is making that transaction lines up with the actual uh, cardholder. And with that said, if there ever is a dispute after the fact, we actually can provide you with the documentation to show the, the data points and the validity of those data points of why we approved that transaction. And usually when it comes to the issuing card banks, once you provide that data, um, then it shows that you did everything in your power to ensure that that was a legit transaction and you end up winning that transaction. Thank you. That looks like that is it for the questions today. Um, if you do have any additional questions, feel free to post them in here as well. We will be sending a recording of this presentation to everybody in attendance along with any questions and answers supplied today. So again, I want to thank you for attending and also want to thank Jamie for sharing her wealth of knowledge with us. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thank you.